one of the things that strikes me the most about Du Bois was he was proud of being African American. He wanted to be African American and American. The word Negro, uh, he fought to have it capitalized in, in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And for me, that is such a powerful statement, the idea to, to have this word capitalized. He really understood, I guess, the power of, of art to, to make people understand race, and in particular, like, um, human relations. He died on the eve of the March to Washington. He died on the eve of the Civil Rights Movement. And I think that Du Bois was potentially such a powerful figure and the government was terrified of him for that reason. I look at Du Bois as more like a deity. His practice as it being important to me. There's several different people who I kind of put in that little pantheon of individuals or things that move me. It's from musicians to grandparents to best friends and people who have come and gone. And I try to carry whatever I may have gotten from their presence. It's almost, that's like the fuel for the work for me. How do you honor this person in a way? My work has always been about honor, um, pride, celebrating who I am. And um, then the one with the double consciousness piece that I was playing with was really playing with this idea of this mirrored image. and. Um, in, in many ways, it's kind of like a self-portrait as, um, as an African-American artist operating in different worlds. Making work, is, it's, it's difficult to talk about the process because it's a lot of things. My studio becomes more like my church, so I have questions, I go to my I go to my studio and I ask questions. The past, but then also the present. What would Du Bois say if he came to Braddock and saw the reality of what we were facing? In the 1980s, all the steel mills had collapsed, and so what was left was a very small population, predominantly African-American families, but not much of an infrastructure or any type of uh, economic stability. At that time, Braddock was pretty much abandoned by the local, state, and government uh, support. So as a child, I didn't realize the magnitude of how heavily we were impacted by disinvestment, but I knew that uh, I was born into poverty and that it was a hard life. Braddock, Pennsylvania is located nine miles outside of Pittsburgh along the Monongahela River. My family migrated there in the early 1900s to work in Andrew Carnegie's steel mill. I was able to start building the body of work that I have been doing for over 11 years now on Braddock. And I saw, you know, a speech by Du Bois at his high school in 1930 about the condition of the Housatonic River. I just started smiling because I knew, like, this was it. This is what would help me figure out the series that I needed to produce. And he goes on to say, the town, the whole valley, has turned its back upon the river. They have sought to get away from it. They have neglected it. They have used it as a sewer, a drain, a place for throwing their waste and their awful. And so I wanted to parallel my personal and autobiographical experience of living along the river with the way Du Bois felt about what had happened to the Housatonic River from since he was a boy and then became an adult. And I was thinking, you know, 
for 10 years I've been on foot photographing Braddock. I'm gonna get up in the air. And I go up into the air to get this aerial view of Braddock. Here we are looking at it in real time, real color, like the flesh, the tissue, and the makeup of this town along this river. I was born by a golden river and in the shadow of two great hills five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And the house was quaint with clapboards running up and down, neatly trimmed, and there were five rooms, a tiny porch. And we wanted it to be a master class to study the life and the legacy of uh, Du Bois. We, did, we read the Credo. They wrote their own credos, they illustrated their own credos, just to get the sense of entering the, 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 the inspiration of Du Bois. I was inspired to write about what I believed in. And here's our very dark water. It's going to take a long time to dry. Slow. What was very important was their own interpretation that's uniquely theirs of the credo from Dark Water. When it came to the boys, I was really thinking about some of his essays. It's just about women and African American women in particular, and sort of our place and sort of the importance of African American women. The the course of my trajectory and sort of my studio practice begins from my experimentation and exploration with using uh, craft materials and taking those craft materials and trying to integrate a low art into sort of a high art dialogue. The perception of hair that has its own sort of like long history um, for African Americans of sort of the acceptance of your really fine coarse curly hair to your straight hair, how that sort of defines how people perceive you. And so for me, I wanted to sort of bring some of that to the forefront as the idea of portraiture. My name is Julie Maratu. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1970. I uh, lived here until 1995 when I went to graduate school in, at the Royal Island School of Design. And since 2007, I've been living part-time in Berlin. But there's this groundwork or foundation that was laid out by someone like Du Bois, who understanding of self and perspective and possibility. And so this comes, I, I think, that in, in trying to negotiate all of these realities, there's a certain place of locating or finding possibility or different possibility for who you can be and how you can be. So these etchings are made trying to invent, make sense, or excavate my own mark making and language. Art has to be more about the kind of wrestling with, with truths. What did Du Bois say? And what I want to know about is, is the truth. I want to know about how this work is, is, is going to further and, and, and progress, you know, people's understanding of, of race and race relations. I'm interested in the Star of Ethiopia for a lot of different reasons. For me, uh, what really 
was most interesting is, is the idea of, of Du Bois, the scholar, as, as being like a creative, you know, force. Being able to produce and to write, a, you know, a pageant in 1913 that was about the 10,000 year history of, of the black race, you know, and, and to be able to have enough resources to have costumes made, to have dancers, to have a director of uh, dramatics. It's a narrative in, in, in a form that I'm not used to dealing with. It's, it's a pageant, which means it's about like postures, it's about gestures, it's about music, it's about going on stage and not necessarily saying it, but being that character and then walking off stage and allowing this processional of, of costumes and music and, and people. As a 21st century artist, it's like, well, what is a pageant? You know, and then I started thinking about music videos. These small moments, these characterizations. Du Bois has uh, one of the protagonists, uh, you know, as, as the veiled woman. And then so, I, I, you know, what I'm working on uh, today is, is, is exploring this idea of, like, uh, Negro womanhood through um, the veiled woman. In a time period where where it was extremely hard for for African Americans to live, he was you know collecting you know ten thousand dollars you know from people to be able to to mount this play and and, and showcasing it in, in ballparks um, in major cities. One of the the greatest attributes of of Du Bois is that he really began you know could understand what it was like to be a black in America, but also. Uh, you know, he, he took that dangerous step to, 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 to be curious, to say, well, what, is, what are white people, th you know, thinking about me interpreting blackness? I prepared the work in my studio for a few weeks in London, packed everything together and sent it, shipped it here. The work was installed by Heidi Johnson, a professional paper hanger. And I kind of freaked out a little bit because I've never done this before. I've never, ever had somebody else install my work. I was kind of trying to plan the piece, that every single thing that I sent Heidi had to be where I said it was going to be. Oh, I found it so difficult, but it worked out. I, I sent her a visual map. This piece is, um, is called Held, February the 23rd. The initial inspiration came from a trip to Ghana in 2005. And the transatlantic slave trade has long been an interest of mine. And I've long wanted to actual, actually travel to the sites. On my return from that trip, this piece of work, Hold, came about. And basically it is a hold, it's um, a holding space for um, um, Africans before they were transported. And in, in this exhibition, Held, I wanted to make something life-size so that, that my audience, the viewer, can, is, is literally held and pulled in. I consider the figures in my piece of work in Held, 23rd of February, in some ways as the souls of black folk. They are, they're ciphers, they're, they're kind of ghosts of African peoples. Du Bois was indicted for not having registered as an agent of a foreign power. He received the indictment on his 83rd birthday. And Du Bois's position, along with the other members of the Peace Information Center, was that they were not agents of a foreign power. They're five files. They're predominantly centered between his 83rd year and his 94th year. The files are redacted, which means, you know, blacked out. So my coming to terms was to remove, remove them, to point them out by cutting them out. And I built an audio narrative 
which in my mind really has to do with the influence of Du Bois. And then there is a third component, a tabloid. The idea is for it to be distributed across campus. It does form a narrative. And so very publicly indicted, very quietly found innocent. In a lot of people's minds, forever guilty. And ultimately, you know, he moved to Ghana when he was 90, 93, 94, and, and died within a year. It occurred to me that I could name a flower for the boys and that I could have thousands of people participate with me in remembrance of, of Du Bois. And in thinking, about, in thinking about this idea, I had actually a peony name for Du Bois and uh, that's been registered with the American Peony Society. It's called the, um, uh, the W.E.B. Du Bois Peony, but its common name will be the Hope Peony. It's sort of an amazing moment in time, historically. You know, you've produced this work and it's about race. Well, it's partly about race, but considerably more. And that's the thing that really interests me, that considerably more. How do we begin to approach blackness and understand blackness as something that is much more complex and complicated than merely blackness? I'm always thinking about, you know, how to activate the space, how to activate the wall, so that the, the, the movement isn't completely linear and flat, that you, have to, that you have to look up and that you have to look down. And I've sort of done some exploration around the peony and its development, and I have photographs of the site and photographs of complementary florals that will go along with this peony uh, in order to anchor our garden. So my, my garden for the boys it's a garden so that people will remember the legacy of an extraordinary man. And I realized at a certain point while looking at another memorial site that I couldn't think of a really great contemplative space for an African American. And then the question was, you know, Du Bois in our time. So how does that then manifest within, you know, specifically for me right now, currently? So the ideas of civil rights and movements that he was fighting for. I grew up in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, and in 1989, my family emigrated to Canada. We are of many generations in Kenya, uh, of a Goan background, Goan Indian background. So kind of this sort of hybrid identity. I've created then a symbolic version of the Encyclopedia for the Negro, and that is a handmade book with black paper. So there's no actual like typing or script or writing in the book. I'm having the University Color Guard march from the Du Bois Library, marching with this book in a procession, giving it its sort of like acknowledgement. How does the performer's body uh, produce a gesture of political movement? In my practice, I've looked at the power of language, the idea of how does one forget a language. So growing up in Kenya, I uh, spoke Swahili. Moving to Canada, that language became lost to me uh, because I wasn't using it. So I'm kind of curious about the process of becoming, the process of being. 
this ideas of like what would this book be the boys struggled to make it but it never it could never it could never exist so i've placed my encyclopedia in the space as an intervention because it's kind of like a question of like well that wasn't made but then it is here and it's sitting in this place of of historic account which then makes it kind of become an artifact and then kind of like also further you know heightens it to become something different you know it's it's is it artwork or is it uh, is it an artifact and it plays within that liminal space so within my piece i have created um, a sort of a wall mural using the sort of colors of um, of the kenyan flag which for me symbolizes a home but symbolizes um, kenya which is very specific to me but also kind of this sort of idea of africa and um, and so and that was a place that you know du bois also kind of mentions and reflects on Throughout his work, throughout his work, uh, the idea of, again about again about a pan Africanism, and so I've created a series of banners that are talking about an end, and in the end we find a new beginning. <laughs>